A very warm welcome to the Brickcore Annual Commercial Conference. This year, the focus is upon the Arbitration Act 1996. Now, for centuries, English law has made a major contribution to the development of arbitration law, and London has been a preeminent seat for much of that time. One of the major themes in arbitration was how to invoke the power of the state in relation to an essentially private contract to resolve disputes. Now, English law created an ingenious fiction which enabled an agreement to arbitrate to be treated as if the reference to arbitration had been made not by the parties, but by the court under its powers to send issues of fact to a referee rather than a jury. The result was that a court could then apply its coercive powers to a recalcitrant party. Now, it may surprise some of you to know that this ingenious fiction was enacted into statute in the first English Arbitration Act in 1698. Over the centuries which followed, English common law developed arbitration law, particularly in relation to the price to be paid for court intervention. What if there had been an error of law? What sort of procedural irregularities would vitiate an award? And latterly, the development of the doctrine of competence competens, which some of you may rightly infer arose outside England, was embraced into the English common law and given a statutory footing in the 96th Act. And this has given rise to issues of policy in relation to the jurisdiction of a tribunal to decide its own jurisdiction. And you'll be hearing more about this later today. But after 25 years, it is easy to overlook quite how innovative the 96 Act was. The announcement at the outset of the statute of general principles in a manner then almost unknown in English statutes, combined with a textual informality and flexibility, was enough to make it unique. But it went way beyond that. Whilst the common law was very flexible, the context of the decision-making in arbitration cases was a supervisory jurisdiction over a consensual process. And the courts simply tended simply to decide whether the feature complained of took the process beyond the bounds of acceptability. And that understandable but essentially negative and reactive function didn't encourage the formulation of general rules about the right way to arbitrate, still less about the development of public policy principles which might be capable of overriding contrary provisions in the arbitration agreement. The 96 Act transformed the picture. It created an accessible and almost complete code of conduct setting out general principles. But there is no statute which cannot be improved, particularly one in an international arena such as this. And today you'll be hearing about three issues which may be capable of sensible improvement. The first is the vexed question of de novo rehearing of substantive jurisdiction by the court. That's an issue close to my heart. Shortly after the 96 Act came into force, I lost an arbitration after a five-day trial in a case called Azov and Baltic. It was cold comfort that the arbitrator said he found the case difficult. I found myself before Mr Justice Ricks, as he then was, on a summons for directions under Section 67 of the Act. It was my submission, made for the first time under the Act, that I was fully entitled to repeat the entire exercise before a commercial court judge. It could well be the same documents, the same questions to the same witnesses, and the same points of fact and law. I was asking the court to endorse Groundhog Day. It was a submission I made with some temerity and indeed fear. Mr Justice Ricks accepted the submission and many cases have followed the line, that line of reasoning up to the decision in Dallas in the Supreme Court. Mr Justice Coleman reached the opposite conclusion to the arbitrator on the facts, which well illustrates what can happen in practice. The issue for today is whether there is any principled way to improve the approach, which superficially at least gives rise to some unattractive consequences. The second issue is whether it's appropriate to have four procedural avenues to challenge substantive jurisdiction under the 96 Act. And the third issue derives not from the Act itself, but from the consequences of the decision of the Supreme Court in Enker and Chubb. In short, the question of whether an arbitration agreement is binding in a London-seated arbitration will be governed by the law applicable to the main contract. Now, in many arbitrations in London, that will not be English law. Many complex and expensive issues will arise from the consequences of this decision. Is it the right or best approach? Now, I'm not going to say any more about these three issues. That's because today is no ordinary arbitration talking shop. You will hear very shortly from some of the most distinguished judges, academics, and practitioners from around the globe who can give a comparative approach to these issues in France, Switzerland, the USA, and Singapore. 
and we're very grateful for their agreement to attend and for taking the trouble to come to London to share their views and the approach taken in their home jurisdictions on these important issues. There's not enough time to tell you about the distinctions of each of them, but they are many and varied. They are an extremely high-powered and distinguished group, and if you haven't already done so, please look up their resumes and prepare to be impressed, prepare to be impressed if you are not already. Closer to home, so far as English arbitration law is concerned, you only have to read the conference programme to see that in each session you'll be hearing from and engaging with titans not only of arbitration, but titans of English law, and they need no introduction. But as a relatively recent member, I can say with a degree of objectivity that there is an extraordinary breadth and depth of talented arbitration counsel at Brick Court. One only has to be reminded of some of the more recent arbitration cases from 2021 in which members of Brick Court have been involved. The Privy Council decision in Rav Bahamas, which was the first decision from an apex court on serious irregularity in 15 years. The Privy Council decision in VRG on appeal from the Cayman Court of Appeal, which concerned the enforcement of awards, de novo review by a Brazilian court, and the impact of the civil law doctrine of Euro Novit Curia. And the Privy Council decision in Betamax, which considered the extent to which an award can be set aside or enforcement refused on the basis that the award conflicts with public policy. In relation to state immunity and enforcement of arbitration awards, the cases include general dynamics in the Supreme Court on service, two decisions of the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal in Tethian and Pakistan on the jurisdiction and power of a court to grant interim relief against a state pending appeal and a general approach to enforcement against states in relation to an exit award. And that's not to mention a very broad range of arbitration and enforcement proceedings across the globe in civil and common law jurisdictions. Now, before I hand over to Sir Nicholas Green, there are two final categories of special mention. First, to our rapporteurs, who are all members of Brick Court with a special interest and practice in international arbitration. They are, in order from which you will hear from them, Alan Shirim, Jesse Ingle, Andres Roditsis, Kyle Lawson, Zara al rakabi and Emily Gonin. And as you will soon see, they are all first-rate practitioners. Second, to Sir Richard Aikins and Salim Moulin, and Brick Court's marketing team of Paul Gray and Pamela Ismalaj. Without them, none of you would be here. And without their combined efforts, there would be a much reduced prospect of improving English arbitration law. Finally, I now hand over to Sir Nicholas Green, another eminent former member of Brick Court, who is also the current chair of the Law Commission of England and Wales. You will also be hearing from him, and at the end of today, from Professor Sarah Green, who's the Law Commissioner for Commercial and Common Law. I need say no more as to why this is not your ordinary talking shop. I very much hope that you enjoy these very interesting and important <coughs> topics over the course of the day. And I now hand over to Sir Nicholas. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what an extraordinary room we're in. You can see behind me uh, that there is uh, the burgeoning of a dispute uh, concerning wheels attached to chariots. Uh, you can see over there that there were discussions between the parties to resolve this dispute. In the panel over there at the back, they're sitting down, they're holding an arbitration, and there is an expert holding forth about wheel technology. The arbitration was successful, there was an award, and there was post-award dancing. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, can I start by putting the Law Commission's project into some sort of a context? And let me explain to you, by way of introduction, who and what the Law Commission is. Uh, the Law Commission is a statutory body set up by an Act of Parliament in 1965. We're nearly 60 years old. It's chaired by a Court of Appeal judge, which is intended to be an absolute guarantee of its independence. In addition, there are four statutory commissioners. Again, each under the Act is independent. They are not civil servants. In constitutional terms, the commissioners are what is known as office holders. They hold their office by virtue of an Act of Parliament. Each commissioner has a team of lawyers. Uh, we have about 70, 70 lawyers and researchers in the commission. They are a unique and very specialist breed. They are subject matter experts. They are also experts in parliamentary procedure and they have a deep knowledge of the Machiavellian working ways of Whitehall and government. They're experts in consultation techniques and in managing stakeholders. 
They're also experts in legislative techniques, though we work very closely on all projects with Parliamentary Council. The decision as to which projects we take on is one for myself and my four commissioners. It is a collective decision. The government cannot, and to be fair, does not, tell us what to do. On the other hand, we do not take on vanity projects or projects of academic interest alone. Before we take on a project, we engage in extensive discussions with stakeholders and with ministers and others in government. The culmination of this process will be a letter from a minister to me inviting us to take on a project. And this will be upon the basis, and this is important, that the government has a serious intention to legislate in the field. When we agree to take on a project, we will therefore have had discussions about timetable and parliamentary slots. Now, at any one time, we will have over 20 legislative projects going on in the Commission. At present, the number's about 23. In addition, we are almost at any one time as well in active negotiation with the government over a range of new products. In fact, I received a letter from the Minister yesterday inviting us to take on a new, really quite high-profile project. And we are at the end game of two further projects. All of these three, assuming we take them on, raise issues of major public importance. It's probably obvious, but we are very reluctant to take on issues that the government of the day sees as political. We are an apolitical body, and for overtly political issues, we take the view that it is for government, not for us, to draft its own legislative proposals. Big is not beautiful. Project teams are small. Even a quite sizable project might have a team of only two or three lawyers under the supervision of the commissioner. In relative terms, the arbitration project is quite small and self-contained. That, of course, is no indication of its importance. It is a significant project. Uh, it sits within a portfolio of projects being undertaken by the commercial team, which seek to modernise aspects of commercial law with an emphasis on the digital economy. Now, we've been wishing to take on a project uh, on arbitration for quite a long time. For some years, it was bogged down in a disagreement between various government departments as to who had responsibility both in terms of subject matter and in terms of finance. Uh, we broke this logjam shortly before COVID struck and we agreed to take on the project. It's been run by the commercial team within the Commission led by Professor Sarah Green, the relevant commissioner, who we, we with us uh, at about tea time. Many of you will have spoken to the team already as part of the intensive discussions that we always have with stakeholders before we issue a consultation paper. Every document, however, that leaves the commission has been subject to a process of peer review by myself and my fellow commissioners. Every document is signed off and approved by the five of us, we have ultimate responsibility for every policy decision. A consultation paper, including this one, is therefore the product of the commissioners, not a team. The peer review process is incredibly thorough and challenging. Imagine the PhD viva from hell. Peer review of a consultation paper, and again this is important to today, is very different to the peer review of a final report. At the consultation paper stage, we review a document upon the basis that it is intended to stimulate responses. We never, ever form a definitive view on anything in a consultation paper. We tee up ideas. We sometimes put out tentative proposals in the hope and expectation that this will stimulate responsive fire from consultees. And the arbitration CP is no exception. Nothing in the document, nothing expresses a final view. Everything is to be played for. Our views inevitably evolve as a consultation progresses. Your responses to this CP are therefore critical. Uh, as commissioners, we, we are not appointed because of our political or our moral or our ethical or religious views. We're appointed because of our professional skills. We follow the evidence. We seek ultimately to create recommendations which above all are practical 
and workable. Now, as for arbitration, we have taken as our starting point that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the Act. Our task is to see whether, and if so, how it can be improved. Now, as to the future, once we have received the consultation responses and we have produced our report, we would then seek to use what is known as the Law Commission Special Procedure. This is used for bills which are essentially technical in nature. We work hard in those areas to ensure that a draft bill is accepted by all political parties. So a team will be speaking to all of the parties across Parliament to gauge their views. If we can convince the relevant parliamentary authorities, the Bills Office, that the bill is technical and essentially uncontroversial, then it will start life with a first reading in the House of Lords. It then goes to committee stage in the Lords and only then to the House of Commons. This is a highly abbreviated procedure and it can lead to Law Commission bills passing through Parliament and into law very quickly, in extremis in a matter of weeks, but generally a relatively limited number of months. Only very recently a Law Commission bill on technical reforms to charities law went through this procedure. Yesterday, a Law Commission bill on paperless trade had its first unopposed reading in the House of Lords. We expect that to be on the statute books in the near future. You may have seen quite a, a lot of coverage of this bill in the Times and on the BBC this morning. In more general terms, we have a very high implementation rate for Law Commission recommendations. Very hard to put absolute figures on this, but it would be in the region of 70 to 80%. You have to measure implementation over a number of years. You can just imagine the discussions we have within Parliament about getting parliamentary slots and parliamentary time at the moment. Just imagine what it's been like as we've had COVID and we've had Brexit going through. But viewed over a period of years, the implementation rate is very high, and that is in large measure a function of the fact that we will have spoken at length to government about their intentions in relation to this subject matter long in advance. Government understands that the bills that we propose represent the best and most workable solution to what are often difficult, technical and complex problems. It is also understood, though sometimes through gritted teeth, that there is a real value in legislation that is being produced through a rigorously objective, independent, apolitical, evidence-based process. Now, our hope, and indeed I think it is fair to say our expectation, is that a bill seeking to amend the Arbitration Act would be considered as a technical, non-controversial measure, and that we would be able to use the Law Commission special procedure. My plea, therefore, to you today is not that you simply sit and listen to the august professionals that you have before you and enjoy the process. Uh, my plea is that you... Tell us about your views. Our consultation ends on the 15th of December, so you have two months. There is an electronic form on the website, but you can write to us in any which way you please, and we will listen very carefully. Finally, the senior lawyer who has worked on this project and is its principal draftsman, Nathan Tamblin, is in the audience. Nathan, where are you? There he is. If you want to blame somebody. Uh, Laura Bogoyne is also here. Uh, who's the uh, head of the senior lawyer in the commercial team, and Sarah Green, the commissioner, will be here uh, later on. Please feel free to speak to them, but most importantly, there's no point from our perspective in having a conference like this unless you give us your views. It can be on everything, it can be on tiny issues, but we need your views. Uh, and they will be synthesised very carefully. You are the experts we are not. I can promise you that the analysis will be extraordinarily rigorous, but it remains the case that you are the experts. So uh, can I say please enjoy the conference and thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christopher Clark. I was uh, some time ago uh, the head of Brick Court Chambers and after reaching the statutory age of the then statutory age of Synecdoche, uh, I began sitting as an arbitrator, and I also sit in Bermuda. It's a great pleasure uh, be, for me to be able to introduce 
the first panel of those who are giving us their insight uh, into the topics uh, which Alan on my right will shortly introduce. The first to speak is Hilary Heilborn, KC. She is a bright star of the arbitral firmament who has built up a strong uh, and long-lasting career uh, as an arbitrator over several decades. She sat in major cases in arbitrations all over the world and all the main uh, arbitral institutions. In addition to her thriving practice, she has been a member of task forces on current topics in international arbitration. She is a former member of the LCIA court and the ICC UK Arbitration and ADR Committee. And she is the author of a practical guide to international arbitration in London. She will be followed by Mrs. Justice Judith Prakash, who has the great distinction of being the first woman to be appointed a permanent judge of the Singapore Court of Appeal. She began uh, at the well-known firm of Drew and Napier, starting as a shipping lawyer uh, and thereafter practicing also in banking and finance and company <laughs> law. She became a judicial commissioner in 1992 and a Supreme Court judge in 1995. She has sat on many cases uh, involving arbitration issues, both at first instance and on appeal, <coughs> and is one of the Supreme Court's specialist arbitration judges. Uh, she was a member of the subcommittee on the review of arbitration law uh, in Singapore, which led to Singapore's International Arbitration Act. Then uh, further to my left is Professor George Berman. He is a world-renowned authority on comparative law, EU law, international trade contracts, WTO dispute resolution, and transnational litigation and arbitration. He has been an international arbitrator for more than four decades, uh, acting in commercial and investment disputes in a whole range of sectors, general commercial contracts, construction, intellectual property, energy, competition law, insurance, telecommunications, transportation, and employment. He also regularly serves as an expert witness before international arbitral tribunals and before courts in arbitral related cases. He is a professor at, amongst other places, at the Columbia University of Law. Well, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today and to share my thoughts uh, with such a distinguished panel. After that write-up, I don't quite know where to begin, but I'll begin on a practical note. Uh, I know my voice carries, and I don't know whether those outside in the hall can hear that there are st seats available, because I've seen people loitering and then going away. So I wonder if a message could be uh, relayed to them that uh, uh, they can still attend this session. Uh, now, as you have heard, the topic of this first session uh, concerns the nature of a Section 68 hearing uh, challenging the substantive jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal, a mandatory provision under the 1996 Act, uh, and to consider whether the proposal, which has, of course, stood the test of time, be changed as recommended by the Law Commission so as to mandate a particular type of review. Uh, the Law Commission proposal is thought-provoking and some may say controversial, uh, and I have just learned we are perhaps in a rather apt venue uh, for this conference because apparently a few years ago it was used for filming a movie which I have to confess I have never heard of, uh, but called The Boat That Rocked. Uh, now let me go to uh, section uh, 67 and the proposal, which I've set up on the screen uh, for reference purposes for those who are not familiar with the current position and the proposal. Uh, and as you, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with section 67, which simply says uh, uh, the party to the arbitral proceedings upon notice shall apply to the court for challenging any award of the arbitral tribunal as to its substantive jurisdiction. Uh, and then there's an order relating, an alternative order relating to declaration. The Law Commission proposal is, however, different. Uh, and it says where a party has participated in arbitral proceedings and has objected to the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal 
and the tribunal has ruled on its own jurisdiction in an award, then any subsequent challenge under section 67 should be by way of an appeal and not a rehearing. In other words, the present statutory provision is not prescriptive, nor is anything enshrined into statute as to the nature of review for such a challenge as is now proposed by the Law Commission. The basic change, therefore, is to move from what has been judicially determined, as you've heard, a de novo hearing, to an appeal. So instead of giving no evidential or legal weight to the award and considering the question anew without constraint as to what evidence or arguments can be put before the court, what is it proposed is effectively that a court should apply an appellate approach, a more limited approach, paying deference to the award, asking the tribunal, asking did the tribunal get it wrong in the sense that was the decision against the weight of the evidence, did it apply the law wrongly, and occasionally in limited circumstances if the evidence was not available, then admitting new evidence. But what is at issue is the legal power of the tribunal to make a decision, not only as to its jurisdiction, but later if it finds jurisdiction, a determination of the merits, the former being the bedrock of the latter. And it's universally acknowledged that arbitration and hence the power of arbitrators to make decisions is based on the party's consent. A party cannot be forced to arbitrate until it agrees to that means of dispute resolution. Issues may arise, as in Dallas, which I shall come to in a moment, as to how to determine such agreement according to different laws and different legal principles, not just English law. But the basic premise remains, parties cannot be forced to arbitrate until they have contracted to do so. Otherwise, they can be deprived of their rights, for instance, to go to court to determine the issue, hence stay proceedings, or risk enforcement proceedings against their assets in another jurisdiction, which they then have to challenge. Uh, the leading case on the topic is, of course, Dalla, a case which uh, I was involved in, in fact, from the very start, as counsel in the arbitration itself, until and including being leading counsel and unfortunately losing in the Supreme Court hearing. Importantly, Dalla was not a Section 67 case, but a case concerning the enforcement of a foreign ward, an ICC award, the seat was Paris, under Section 102. 3.2b of the 1996 Act, and Article 5.1a of the New York Convention on the basis that it was not a valid arbitration agreement according to French law. And it concerned a thir third party, the government of Pakistan, which was a non-signatory. And the GOP, the government of Pakistan, objected to the tribunal's jurisdiction. In the present context, the Supreme Court considered two linked questions, namely the nature of the exercise which an enforcing court has to undertake and the relevance of the tribunal's own ruling. And it was made clear by the Supreme Court that the issue of jurisdiction was to be way, by way of an independent judicial rehearing and not by way of any form of appeal or review. And section 67 was referred to by way of analogy. Lord Mance, in rejecting any argument for a flexible review akin to an appeal, stated, and I quote, domestically there is no doubt that whether or not a party's challenge to the jurisdiction has been raised, argued, and decided before the arbitrator, a party who has not submitted to the arbitrator's jurisdiction is entitled to a full judicial determination on evidence of an issue of jurisdiction before the English court on an application made in time for that purpose under section 67 of the Arbitration Act 1966, just as he would be entitled under section 72 if he'd taken no part before the arbitrator. Now, of course, there is some difference between Section 67 uh, and Article 5 and Section 103 
in the sense that the latter requires a party resisting enforcement of an award to furnish proof of the lack of validity, and the court ultimately retains a discretion over enforcement in any event. But there's no distinction in the context of the rehearing. And the underlying premise is that arbitrators, whether overzealous or simply wrong, cannot ascribe to themselves jurisdiction without a thorough independent legal check. That's the bootstraps argument, and it's fundamental. So now let me turn to the Law Commission's proposal. And taking what appears to be a fashionable approach these days, unaccompanied by an advocacy role as I now sit as an arbitrator, I'm doing a U-turn. And to misquote uh, Margaret Thatcher, this lady is for turning. Uh, I disagree with the Law Commission's proposals for these reasons. First, it is out of kilter with the procedure in many other jurisdictions. DALA has widely become the gold standard. I'm not going to address the other jurisdictions. Others more qualified than me will do so. But if London is to retain its place amongst key arbitral centers, there needs to be a very sound reason for change and for it to become an outlier. Second, it leads to inconsistent approaches between enforcement of English seated awards and foreign awards, as well as both English awards which are not challenged here, but are then sought to be enforced in a foreign country, and also foreign awards enforced in England under Section 103. Third, one of the premises on which the proposal is based is fairness, the two bites at the cherry argument, the hearing before the tribunal being a dress rehearsal for the main event, the court hearing. And a key passage in the Law Commission proposal states, what we think a party should not be able to do is to ask a tribunal to issue an award and for that party to insist that the award is binding, but only if the tribunal finds in its favour and if not, then to assert that the award can be ignored. It cannot be a case of heads I win, tails it does not count. It may be appropriate to allow for an appeal, but we are not persuaded that it is fair to pursue a rehearing before the court, which ignores what has gone on before the tribunal. Well, with the greatest respect, I believe that really misses the point because it confuses awards on the merits with awards on jurisdiction, it confuses tactics with the right to arbitrate in the first place. And the nature of the tribunal's jurisdiction does not depend on whether or not a party wins or loses on the merits, nor for that matter whether it wins or loses on jurisdiction. A section 67 applies to both a winning and losing party. So therefore, the nature of the review should not do so either. Moreover, in practice, jurisdiction is often interwoven with the merits. So the, tri the tribunal will not be able to deal with jurisdiction at the outset in isolation. And often that is why it is deferred to the main hearing. And moreover, the proposal penalizes those who want jurisdiction determined and resolved early. Uh, my fourth criticism is that it fails to indicate what is meant by partic participation and to distinguish between those who could have a full judicial hearing under section 72 because they have not participated but only objected to jurisdiction and those that cannot. Is it participation for jurisdiction or jurisdiction and the merits? Is it oral participation? For example, in Dalla, they made without prejudice written submissions on the issue of jurisdiction and objected, but they did not turn up to argue it orally. If a party simply turns up to object, but then takes no part in submissions or the merits, is that participation? Parties and their counsel uh, do all sorts of variables uh, in arbitration, often driven by tactics, but there may be other reasons as well. A fifth uh, comment is that one of the other just justifications is that it saves cost and delay through repetition. Uh, this is a very narrow way of assessing the issues and how in any event can it be assessed? Will it lead to more parties just sitting back and waiting for the award or even enforcement and then challenging, which could turn out to be even more costly? 
Uh, and if it's right that there are only a few cases involved, uh, this may be another reason why that argument does not really hold water. Critically, and a point which doesn't seem to have been addressed, is that a genuine non-party signatory will have had no choice as to the seat of arbitration because it will never have consented to the arbitration in the first place. Thus, that party could find itself in an English seated arbitration, but if it found itself in another jurisdiction, it would be entitled to a different sort of review uh, from uh, other seats. So there is an inconsistency there as well. So let me uh, conclude by looking at what is the real concern. And I would suggest that the real concern here is a concern of procedure, not powers. The former offer rules and courts to decide. The latter offer statutes. For example, Article 34 of the Model Law doesn't say how the court should approach the issue of setting aside, but merely the grounds which reflect the New York Convention. And similarly, various provisions in our current 1996 Act. But by setting the matter out in statutory language, it removes the flexibility inherent in the current procedure, which the courts have determined to be a rehearing, but nonetheless enables the court to tailor the procedure to meet the case. And there is an important distinction between evidence given previously and whether that needs to be repeated and the legal and evidential weight to be given to the award itself, which in Dalla was considered to have no probative value. A rehearing is therefore not consistent with the flexible procedure. Summary dis disposition, as was uh, advocated in the Kababji case, is still possible with a rehearing. Likewise, in the Kababji case, one can direct preliminary issues. As in Dalla, you can use at first instance before Richard Aikens some of the original evidence, but not by recalling the witnesses. One can take that from the transcript or the witness statements. What happened in Dalla was that the uh, original argument was based on a different law, and so there had been no evidence of French law. And so the French uh, legal experts gave evidence at the rehearing. Uh, and that was necessary in that case. Uh, and again, it enables the courts to adjust to the nature of the issue because you have two, uh, the scale is quite wide. At one end, you have a party who has never been a party to the arbitration, either because they didn't agree or because they allege fraud, misrepresentation or corruption. But the other may be simply a question of arbitrability uh, between parties who have consented to arbitration but not to a particular aspect of it. Uh, and so uh, my suggestion would be that the way to deal with this is to revise, if necessary, and I'm not sure it is necessary, uh, the rules rather than revising the statute. Uh, but obviously, if there is compulsion to revise the statute, uh, then I would urge that it be a rehearing. Uh, and let me just make a suggestion uh, of the sort of provision one could have if one had to have it in a statute uh, uh, added to rehearing or otherwise in the rules. Something along these lines, that in determining the procedure for any such, if it's rehearing, under section 67, the court should take account of the extent to which the party opposing jurisdiction participated and had the opportunity to adduce evidence. The nature of the jurisdictional challenge and such other matters as the court deems appropriate. Uh, and that would encompass it in some more uh, rigorous form, but preferably in the rules, what in fact uh, is already judge law. So let me end by saying and reiterating that of course London, we know, is one of the world's leading centers for international arbitration. Uh, this proposal by enshrining a particular procedure I fear far from enhancing its reputation as an arbitral center will have a deleterious effect. While in practical terms, there are likely to be a limited number of cases effective, affected, in perspective terms, it will send the wrong message uh, and I believe is a retrograde step. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. I am very honored to have been asked to address you on the Singapore position regarding the standard of review on jurisdictional issues in arbitration. By way of brief introduction, international commercial arbitration in Singapore is governed by the International Arbitration Act 1994, or the IAA, as we usually refer to it. The IAA was enacted specifically to promote the development of international arbitration in Singapore. It gives the ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration the force of law and also gives effect to the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. As a matter of course, the Singapore courts look to the model law and connected ancillary material like the preparatory documents for guidance in relation to issues arising in international arbitration proceedings. Even if there is no specific provision in the model law relating to an issue, the court will consider its approach in coming to a decision. The issue that we are dealing with in this panel, that of the standard of review, which the court should apply when faced with the tribunal's ruling on jurisdiction, is one of those which is not mentioned in the model law and is left entirely for the court to decide. Pursuant to the IAA, there are three situations in which a court will have to decide on a tribunal's jurisdiction after the tribunal has rendered its views. First, where the tribunal has rendered its ruling on jurisdiction as a preliminary question, which is section 10 of the IAA read with article 16.3 of the model law. Secondly, where a party applies to set aside a final arbitral award on the merits on the basis that the, uh, the tribunal lacked jurisdiction, and this is articles 34, 2, sub para A, 1, or article 34, 2, sub para A, 3 of the model law. And thirdly, where a party resists the recognition and enforcement of an award on the merits on the basis, again, of lack of jurisdiction. And that's Article 36, 1A, um, sub 1 and sub 3 of the model law. Article 36, as you probably know, is in terms almost identical to Article 5 of the New York Convention. In the first two situations, the Singapore court is the supervisory court, but in the third, it is the enforcing court only and has no power to set aside the award irrespective of whether it could have done so earlier if the application had been made within the specified time. In all three situations, however, the Singapore court will conduct a de novo review of the tribunal's award or preliminary ruling on jurisdiction. The main cases expressing this principle are a case called Sanum Investments and the Government of the Lao People's Democratic Republic in respect of a preliminary determination, a case called AKN and ANALC, I'm sorry, Singapore case names are hard to remember, um, in respect of an application to set aside a final award, and a case called PT First Media TBK and Astro Nusantara International BV in the context of resisting recognition and enforcement under Article 36 of the model law. The de novo standard of review has been used in relation to model law applications for at least two decades. In 2003, in a case called PT Tugu Pratama Indonesia and Magma Nusantara Limited, I expressed the view in the High Court that this was the standard based on the wording of Article 16.3 and of the model law. Under that article, 
where a party makes an application to the court after the tribunal renders its preliminary ruling on jurisdiction, the court is to, quote, decide the matter, unquote, of jurisdiction. This was observed to be language suggesting that the court's jurisdiction is original, as opposed to appellate in nature. I repeated that observation a few years later in Insigma Technology Company Limited and Alstrom Technology Limited. Two other reasons were given in the Insigma case. First, that the procedure to determine jurisdiction is available to a party that took no part in the arbitral tribunals. If the court was confined to a review of the tribunal's decision, this would greatly undermine the ability of the challenging party to make its case. Secondly, if there is to be a challenge on an issue of fact, the court should not be in a worse position to make its assessment than the tribunal was. The issue was first brought up in the Singapore Court of Appeal in the PT First Media case. That was decided in 2014. There, a Singapore seated tribunal had found it had jurisdiction over two parties who were not signatories to the arbitration agreement. The case came before the Singapore courts at the enforcement stage, like DALA, and therefore the applicable provision was Article 36 of the model law. In submissions, the court was asked to follow the UK Supreme Court's decision in DALA. As you know, and as Hillary has reminded you, that case determined that a party who challenged the tribunal's jurisdiction was entitled to a, quote, full judicial determination on evidence of this issue. In Dalla, the question had arisen in the context of an application to enforce an award under the New York Convention. The Singapore Court of Appeal adopted the full determination view on the basis that there was no principled reason for the position under the model law to be any different from that under the New York Convention. The court noted earlier High Court authorities in Singapore that had held that the standard of review was de novo and specifically affirmed them. It further agreed with Lord Mance in Dalla that the tribunal's view of its own jurisdiction has no legal or evidential value before the court that is considering that question. The Sanum case reaffirmed the above position. And in fact, the counsel in that case did not challenge the, the de novo standard. They rather sought to limit it in some ways. But the Court of Appeal in Sanum added that in considering the matter afresh, the court will, of course, consider what the tribunal has said, because this might well be persuasive. Commentators have contended that Singapore's approach on the standard of review is based on the model law. For example, it was noted in Arbitration in Singapore, a practical guide, that all the judgments rendered in DALA show that the basis for the application of de novo review is premised on the wording of section 103, subsection 2 of the Arbitration Act 1966, sorry, 1996, which provides for a party to prove the ground stated to resist the enforcement of an award. The commentary pointed out that articles 32A and 361A of the model law expressly provide that a party has to do, adduce proof of the ground of objection, in this case, the lack of jurisdiction. By the same token as that used in DALA, the de novo standard must be applied to jurisdictional objections listed under Articles 34 and 36. However, looking at the cases again, I think that there is little by way of explicit direction in the model law on this point. The word proof 
may not bear the significance we give to it. The Singapore court's adoption of this standard was perhaps based on traditional attitudes towards the court's supervisory role in relation to arbitration as expressed in the Azov shipping case and on the recognition of a need for a check and balance that is outside the world of, of arbitration. As the Hong Kong courts have noted, the ultimate decision on jurisdiction must be with the courts, as otherwise the tribunal would be the final judge in its own cause. The competence competence principle, which is a basic tenant of the model law, did not influence the Singapore court at all in relation to the situation after a tribunal has made its jurisdictional ruling. It, however, plays a much bigger role in the Singapore court's approach to stay applications where jurisdiction has yet to be decided. Coming to what a de novo review entails, first, the court must consider the matter afresh and make an independent determination on the issue of jurisdiction. The court does not give deference to the tribunal's findings in that it is not bound to accept or take account of the tribunal's findings or reasoning on the matter. That said, as I mentioned, the court can still consider what the tribunal has said because its reasoning may be persuasive. Secondly, the Singapore courts undertake a de novo review in respect of issues of facts. This does not mean that all that transpired before the tribunal should be disregarded, necessitating a full rehearing of all the evidence. A de novo review just means that the court has liberty to consider the material before the tribunal unfettered by any principle limiting its fact-finding abilities. In most cases, there is no need to take extra evidence or allow counsel to conduct another round of cross-examination of witnesses who have already given evidence before the tribunal. But in appropriate circumstances, of course, uh, where there is good reason, like a breach of natural justice before the tribunal, um, new evidence, fresh evidence, and a rehearing of that evidence will be admitted instead of being in full, instead of being admitted only on paper. As for fresh evidence, which had not been placed before the tribunal, there is still some uncertainty in Singapore law as to whether parties need to satisfy a variant of the Ladd and Marshall test before they are permitted to adduce fresh evidence or whether they are allowed to adduce it without having to cross any hurdle. I think it is likely that Ladd and Marshall, Marshall, if it applies, will be applied in a very attenuated way. The Singapore courts also undertake a de novo review of issues of law, which means that parties are entitled to put forward new arguments before the court, which had not been raised before the tribunal. Just a brief mention that in Hong Kong, which is also a model law jurisdiction, um, the court of first instance in a case called S Company and B Company followed in Sigma and Dalla and, decide, and gave three reasons for undertaking a de novo review. First, that Article 16 provides for the court to decide the matter of the tribunal's jurisdiction. Thus, the court should not be bound or restricted by the tribunal's preliminary decision on its own jurisdiction. Secondly, the court should not be in a worse position than the arbitrator in its determination of the challenge. And finally, natural justice requires such an independent review, as, other, as otherwise the tribunal would judge its own powers. The Hong Kong court held that the de novo standard applied for, adopted for preliminary, preliminary rulings should also apply in the context of setting aside or enforcement. 
Um, finally, there is an Australian case in New South Wales called um, Lynn Tiger Plastering and Platinum Construction, which considered Dalla, considered the Singapore cases and the Hong Kong case, and concluded that he, the, the hearing the jurisdiction issue de novo is the correct standard to be applied in these situations. The Singapore courts, I think they, they, this question of whether the standard should be de novo or anything else has not come up before us again for a number of years. Council accept it. Um, they do try and challenge jurisdiction, but they do not challenge the standard of review. And I think it is highly unlikely, talking about the con in, in, the, in the present context, that there will be any change in Singapore or Hong Kong um, in the near future, because the standard has served us well and council are familiar with it. In fact, some council, I think a, a number of council, especially those who are challenging on behalf of parties who have been unwillingly corralled into the, into the arbitration, um, are happy with it. And so whilst we did have recently um, some discussion on review of the arbitration law of Singapore, this, this particular question wasn't mentioned at all as an issue. And so I don't think it's likely to be brought up in the near future or in the medium term for that matter. Thank you. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I too want to uh, thank the organizers for having invited me to speak today. The topic uh, of this panel is one of great uh, salience uh, in the United States today. Uh, and I would say remains a bit unsettled, but it won't prevent me from, um, I think, more or less clearly identifying uh, the issues as seen uh, from the United States. Uh, the first thing I think worth mentioning is that we have in the United States um, a, a tendency, or at least an inclination, to unpack the meaning of jurisdiction, uh, to be as precise as possible, and to draw a distinction between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional threshold issues. Going by the, by the term, most commonly, of gateway versus non-gateway issues, gateway signifying that one has an entitlement uh, to independent judicial determination of the matter, and it is understood to include the following. Uh, was an arbitration agreement formed? If formed, was it valid? If formed and valid, does it cover the dispute at hand? And of course, a non-signatory bound or not bound. Non-gateway issues, also threshold issues, which courts will not in principle touch, are whether a party has waived its right to arbitrate, whether the claim is race judicata, whether a precondition to arbitration has been satisfied, and whether the claim, the claim is timely. Gateway issues are thought, and in my view most certainly are, matters of consent, fundamental and bedrock. They go by the term, sometimes, substantive arbitrability. The non-gateway issues in many civil law countries will go by the name of admissibility. So I want to be clear what it is we're talking about. We're talking about the first set of issues that I mentioned. Now the next important point, and it's very, very apparent to me, is that the question of the standard of review 
following the issues, issuance of an award is truly only a part of the picture. I can tell you, if only because of the work done in preparation of the American Law Institute restatement, that the number of cases in which the jurisdiction of a tribunal is called into question before the arbitration vastly outweighs the number of cases in which the jurisdiction of the tribunal is assessed after the award has been rendered. In fact, in a course on international arbitration, one has to spend weeks on the question of the enforceability of the arbitration agreement against jurisdictional challenges. So that in United States practice, the, determine of the determination of the standard of, of judgment uh, is um, obviously not an afterthought, but it comes against the background of a very high likelihood that a court has already been asked to make those determinations. Is the arbitration agreement valid? Can be raised when an agreement is asserted. Whether the scope of the arbitration agreement covers the dispute likely to have been raised at the time the arbitration agreement has been sought to be enforced. And above all, of course, non-signatory. The non-signatory is not going to wait for the arbitration to occur. I think that, that should be fairly obvious. Uh, so we have a choice to make. And the American position has been relatively clear. Uh, before the arbitration occurs, parties are entitled to a full independent determination without anticipatory deference, what I would call anticipatory deference uh, to a tribunal. We avoid the word de novo. It's obviously inapt at this moment in time because there hasn't been a determination. There's nothing to be de novo about. So we're talking about independent, fully independent determination on the basis of whatever the court has um, at its disposal. Post-award, de novo, review, meaning not that the arbitral hearing is reconducted, but as my colleagues have pointed out, uh, that independent judgment based on the record as possibly in a discriminating manner elaborated or added to. Uh, but independent does not mean de novo, at least in our understanding of the terms. Uh, and I think it's good to keep that strongly in mind. Obviously, from what I've said, we are still of the old-fashioned view that consent is critical and that parties are entitled to a judicial determination of whether they consented to arbitrate the dispute at hand and they are entitled to that judicial um, intervention to be conducted on an independent basis. Why do we do this? A lot has already been said. But basically we do it because in principle, we think the legitimacy of arbitration is contingent on consent and a validation of consent if it's challenged. And that the only counter argument is one of efficacy of arbitration. And you all decide for yourself what you think the proper trade-off is between legitimacy, if you believe it is at stake, on the one hand, and efficacy on the other hand. And it's entirely clear where the United States stands, subject to something I will say shortly. I think, as, as Hillary very well put it, what we observe when we don't take this position is an unwarranted extrapolation 
from the review of the merits of a dispute to the question of jurisdiction of the tribunal. In fact, as I think Hillary mentioned, our confidence in the legitimacy of the arbitration, the jurisdiction of the tribunal, is the predicate. It is actually the predicate of our willingness not to review independently the merits. And the case for not independently reviewing the merits is greatly weakened by an unwillingness to independently review the question of jurisdiction. I wish American law had remained that way. But I am dismayed to have to report to you that a system, at least to my mind, as utterly sound as the one I've described um, has been undone. Um, and it's been undone for the purest of motives. In the interest of party autonomy, which is also a bedrock principle, the Supreme Court has held that parties are entitled to deviate from the understandings that I have just mentioned. That they can forfeit access to a court exercising independent review in the interest of party autonomy. But the bias against that and the presumption against their having done that is so great that that cannot be found to be the case absent, quote, clear and unmistakable evidence of what has come to be called a delegation of authority to determine jurisdictional issues. The term delegation is now in great use. This is the very famous first options case in which Justice Breyer, writing for a unanimous court, said consent is the cornerstone. Party autonomy is another cornerstone. And we will allow the principle of consent as vindicated by independent judicial intervention uh, to be altered if we are absolutely certain that that is what the parties intended. On the level of principle, that's probably unobjectionable. However, as you might well anticipate my saying, all depends on what is found to be clear and unmistakable. And this is um, an unfortunate story. Uh, why? Because if one wanted to make this forfeiture that I'm referring to clear and unmistakable, it could clearly and unmistakably be done using word like, simple English word like exclusively, for example. But parties aren't quite doing that yet, so our courts are trying to find clear and unmistakable evidence of this surrender, if I may call it that, elsewhere. And the courts have found clear and unmistakable evidence in two principal circumstances, neither of which is acceptable, in my humble opinion. Though I don't sound humble, I, I recognize this. First, if the parties in their arbitration agreement incorporated a set of institutional rules, and that set of institutional rules provides for competence, competence, then they have clearly and unmistakably forfeited their right to judicial determination. I hope you're shocked. And this, in spite of the fact that competence, competence in the United States does not have the famous French negative dimension. It has never been thought to have it. So to read competence, competence, merely because it appears in a set of institutional rules as having a different meaning than competence, competence has, is an indefensible. Secondly, 
it's quite clear from first options that Justice Breyer and the full court were very, very attached to the principle of independent determination of consent. And it would be only in presumably exceptional circumstances, though it needn't be exceptional, where the parties have unmistakably indicated that they wish a different regime. Competence, competence clauses are ubiquitous. They're in every set of modern institutional rules. They're in, it's in the model law. It's in all recent arbitration laws. If the mere presence in a set of, I would like to say buried, in a set of procedural rules that no one will have read until the dispute arises at best, if that's clear and unmistakable evidence, then we only and always have unmistakable evidence. Virtually always. First options has been turned on its head. Secondly, and no less shockingly, in a recent decision, in an investor state case, okay. Beijing Shugang versus Mongolia, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the most active court of appeals in our field, has ruled that if the respondent challenges the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and the claimant responds by asserting that the tribunal has jurisdiction, then the claimant, unhappy with the award that dismissed its claim, has, by arguing the matter to the tribunal, has clearly and unmistakably forfeited its right to post-award review. The premise appears to be that there's only one forum available to you. You either argue jurisdiction before the tribunal, and then you have clearly and unmistakably foregone your entitlement to independent judicial determination. One may well ask, what is the claimant to do what is the claimant to do when the tribunal has declined jurisdiction? Is it to sit on its hands? I think not. The only responsible and professional thing to do is to seek to sustain the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And once having done that, no access to a court other than perhaps on a deferential standard of review. Uh, so I, I come to you, you know, I'm delighted to be here, but I come to you with a heavy heart uh, because I think uh, our judiciary has been unconscionably lazy, intellectually lazy. And it has, without even knowing it, destroyed what I consider to be essential to the legitimacy of arbitration. Thank you.